Pranam. We are here at the international headquarters of Self-Realization Fellowship located in Los Angeles, California. And we warmly welcome you to this week-long immersion in the Kriya Yoga teachings of our guru and founder, Paramahansa Yogananda. This seven-day event will include a full program of classes, daily live-streamed meditations, kirtans, and other special events. We will also offer virtual tours to the beautiful ashram centers founded by Paramahansaji. All the classes this week will be held inside in the chapel. The chapel is a very sacred place. It's permeated with the blessings of Paramahansa Yogananda. It was there that he led many meditations, Kriya Yoga initiations, services and gatherings. And to this day, it is used for meditation, as many of you know who have visited here before. Now, to begin our convocation, the 2021 World Convocation, let us join Brother Chidananda, the President of Self-Realization Fellowship, and you go to Satsanga Society of India in that sacred chapel. Loving greetings and pranams. All of you gathered all over the world, joining us here at this holy ashram. And to the greetings that we're just conveyed by Sister Draupadi and Brother, Brother Jayananda. Let me add my own warm welcome to all of you as we begin this convocation together. It's such a joy to be with you live this morning. And especially it's a joy to feel as I'm greeting you, the boundaries of this sacred chapel where I'm seated, expand into the vastness of our most wonderful SRF Wallace Temple. It encompasses the whole world. Since we have participants joining us this week from more than 130 countries around the world. Welcome to all of you. So let's take a moment and just feel that great spiritual family, that great spiritual community that we are joining together with for the next seven days. Take a moment right now to calm your mind. Close your eyes. Put your attention on the heart. And there feel the great joy, that great joy that is glowing at this very moment in the hearts and the consciousness of thousands and thousands of SRF and YSS devotees and friends all around the world. It's a powerful feeling. It's a tangible feeling. And though we are not together in a physical lecture hall, we are together in that enfolding love and blessings of our guru and param gurus. It fills 
and consecrates this sacred space, this Wallace Temple, where we're going to spend many hours over the next week meditating, communing with the divine, saturating our consciousness with the liberating wisdom of Paramahansa Yogananda. And so in his name, I welcome each and every one of you. Before we have our opening prayer, let me just say something about the, the different ways of participating in this week's, con this week's program. First of all, I know we have uh, quite a few newcomers this week and special welcome to all of you who are uh, joining us and haven't been to an SRF or YSS event in the past. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you. And for all of the newcomers, anyone who's um, just discovering these teachings, just discovering the path, Convocation, it's a fantastic introduction. It's a great introduction to the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda and to the science of God realization, of Kriya Yoga, and to Paramahansa Yogananda's lineage of gurus who represent that Kriya Yoga science. Now, during the week, you're going to get a really thorough overview from all of the classes, the, um, the other activities, meditations, and so on. It's a whole integrated package. You'll get a very thorough overview. But I want to make a point about this because you'll find those who go deeper discover that convocation has a whole other dimension. It is a living transmission of spiritual consciousness and power and blessings. In India, we call that darshan. You know, there's a, a story in Autobiography of a Yogi, our guru's um, life story. And uh, there was a woman disciple of Lahiri Mahashai. And one time she asked him uh, to please let her have a copy of his photograph. She wanted, uh, she wanted it as a reminder. She wanted it to be a, a conduit of his blessings and his help. So the great guru handed her a copy. But he said, as he handed it to her, if you deem it a protection, then it is so. Otherwise, it's only a picture. So I'd say the same about this online convocation. If you think it's a video, then that's what it is. But if you think of it as a transmission and approach it with that openness and that desire to receive those spiritual blessings, then that is what it is. And that's what I'm hoping and praying and knowing as the days go by during this, this wonderful program. That's what each of you will enter into more and more deeply. So let's just take a moment now to, um, to enter into that divine presence. Again, please close your eyes. Sit up straight in the meditation posture. Now inhale deeply and hold the breath. And then exhale and relax. Again, inhale deeply. Exhale and relax. One more time. Inhale, feel the peace permeating your body. And now, settling into that peace, lift your eyes and your consciousness. Gaze into that point between the eyebrows 
the spiritual eye, that great portal to the presence of God. Visualize it as a great golden light shining from eternity. And in the midst of that light, a sapphire opalescent blue sphere of light. And then the beautiful shining white star of divine consciousness, of cosmic consciousness, shining from eternity. From that source of divine consciousness, feel that light of God. Let that light of God blaze forth into your consciousness. Feel it illumining all the corners of your mind and thoughts and feelings. Feel that you are receiving that light, that consciousness, as we invoke the presence of God in our beloved lineage of gurus here on the altar. So pray with me, Heavenly Father, Mother, friend, beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, and our Guru Paramahansa Yoganandaji, and saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, bless all of us who are participating in this convocation. Bless me to feel your presence during this convocation. Bathe me in your light. Open my consciousness. Open my heart. Open my mind. And let me be immersed in your divine presence. Wash me in your light. Let me feel that light washing away all tension, dissolving and removing all worldly fears and restlessness and worries that I may relax and open myself to your blessings, to the ceaseless flow and oceanic flood of your divine love and joy. Om. 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 Well, now we feel that this wallless temple, this sacred space where we're going to be gathering together for the next seven days, has been truly consecrated and made ready for us to dive into this wonderful program. And it's such a privilege to introduce this convocation. You probably know the, the keynote or the theme for this week is 
discovering your soul's infinite potential. Now, the methods, the specific techniques of doing that, that's going to take all of the classes, all of the programs over the next seven days to fully unfold. But I wanted to be here to introduce it to you this morning and especially or mainly to greet you and convey the love and the blessings of our great guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, and also the divine friendship and support of all of us who live and serve in his ashrams. You know, I want to begin by expressing how wonderfully inspiring it's been during this past year of pretty much continuous difficult challenges for so many people. It's been so inspiring to see how many of you are doing the work to bring into manifestation this divine way of life that Paramahansa Yogananda has given us. Doing that work. Yes, it does take work, but what rewarding work it is. Haven't you found it so? Because, think about it, life on earth, life in God's universe, it becomes such an amazing experience every day when we engage in the circumstances, in the situations that confront us with, from the perspective of the soul, that spark of divinity within each one of us. It's just impossible to describe the, the sense, of, sense of freedom that this consciousness bestows. Because then when, when problems arise, and they do, but when they arise, then as souls, we deal with them in one of two ways. Either we use our divine power of will, which is native to our souls, implanted there by, by the all-powerful omnip omnipotent spirit. We use that divine power of will to find or create a solution so that that problem no longer exists because we've conquered the problem. That kind of creativity, that kind of will to solve problems, whatever the world throws at us, that is within each one of us waiting to be expressed. So either we find, the problem, we find a solution to the problem or we change our mental attitude, our, really our sense of identity, so that we're no longer susceptible to whatever it is, the pain, the suffering sometimes, even just the inconvenience or the annoyance caused by those problems. Why? Because we identify not as a mortal, body-bound ego. You know, those egos that have endless sensitivities and touchy moods and selfishness and victim consciousness, all of those things that go along with the ego. Instead, we identify as immortal, invincible souls, beloved of God, beloved of God. And then, then we're able to help those around us as well, whether in small ways or large ways, to likewise overcome the pain and the suffering and the challenges of their own lives. Isn't that a beautiful vision? That, in a nutshell, is what each of us can attain through the teachings that are being presented this week. And again, there's no words. There's no words to describe the sense of freedom, the fulfillment that this consciousness brings. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that life becomes uneventful or that challenges just magically go away. No, it means that we view the challenges that come to us with the right attitude, the right attitude, the attitude of a divine warrior. And ultimately, believe it or not, as entertainment. And then in that consciousness, we no longer question, ah, is there any meaning to this chaos that is my life? No, instead, we find ourselves filled with the power, 
that comes from aligning our personal goals, our personal desires with the eternal divine purpose of life. So here we are to get a taste of that power, that divine consciousness of the soul's infinite potential. And that's why we've come together this week in this invisible but magnificent Wallace Temple. Now I have a, um, I have a suggestion for you as we begin. And uh, the simplest way to express it is this. I urge you, make convocation a sacred pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. That means, you know, think about that. Think about that word. Think about what that means. It means that we consciously step aside from all of the routines, all of the um, daily worries and cares as much as we're able to. We set that aside for this brief period of time and we set our mind and our hearts on making that pilgrimage into the holy places where we can feel that greater connection with God and the Great Ones. You know, many years ago, our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda, he said this. He said, there's a, there's a great deal of benefit in visiting shrines where great saints and gurus have lived and meditated. For even when they are gone, their spiritual magnetism remains as a tangibly uplifting vibration in the places that they have frequented. I want to share something beautiful about that. One time uh, years ago, our revered former president, Sri Dayamata, who, who I'm, all of you, most of you remember with, with great love and reverence, she was talking to us and she said, here at Mount Washington, she said, in the early days, Master Paramahansa Yogananda, we call him Master because he has that perfect self-mastery that each of us is trying to achieve and will achieve. So she said, Master used to have public classes down here in the, the Temple of Leaves area. You can, um, you can visit that and enjoy that during the virtual um, pilgrimage tours that are there on our convocation website. So she said he spent many hours there with us in those earliest years, meditating, giving satsangs, and you know, in that, um, in that wonderful documentary film, Awake the Life of Yogananda, which again is available for us to watch on our Convocation website this week, there's one scene that shows an old film clip, um, silent movie from the 1920s, in which the master is giving a class just in that area by the Temple of Leaves. You remember that? And he must have been in this, when the film captured this, he must have been impressing some powerful wisdom and truth and affirmation deep into the consciousness of those who we can see in the audience because we see him moving his arm and his, his hand again and again as he spoke, impressing that, that power, that truth on them. So that was down there in the Temple of Lees. Now, Diamata continues, she said, she wanted to share with us some of the Master's words that I recorded back in 1932. He had just finished a series of summer classes in the Temple of Leaves, and he said this, I want you to come to Mount Washington, not for the love of personalities, but to love the spiritual vibrations and to really seek self-realization. Come here to meditate and to feel God. If you form the habit of coming here for God, you shall receive the best in spirituality. And then he went on. And it was almost as though he wanted to make sure that when we heard these words, he wanted to make sure that we would understand that he wasn't just talking to those few devotees that were present on that day. 
He was talking to you and to me and to future generations because he went on to say this. He said, I am living in the eternal flame of spirit. This body has come and it will go, but I shall not recognize that. I have seen long before I was born in this body and I shall also see when this body will be gone that I am the ever-living flame. I am living in the eternal present and I shower the blessings of the great ones on all of you. So I'm so glad that all of you are here because that showering of blessings from those great gurus, that transmission of spiritual consciousness, that's what each of you can experience and feel during this week of pilgrimage, this week of convocation. So you may wonder, and um, what do I mean by transmission? Let me talk about that for a moment. But first of all, for those of you who are, are new to our SRF and YSS gatherings, I want to introduce to you our lineage of gurus on the altar. You can see here, you can show, can we show the altar? There we go, thank you. In the center, Jesus Christ and Bhagavan Krishna. And then to the, to the left of Jesus, Mahavatar Babaji. To the left of him, Lahiri Mahashai. And then going over to the right side, all the way over, Swami Sri Yukteswar. And then coming to the left of him, our guru and founder, Paramahansa Yogananda. Now we have to realize each of these avatars radiates, I would say, a unique personal mix of pure divine qualities of the eternal spirit. Each one has that distinctive vibration, that distinctive mix of qualities. And this is what's such, so thrilling to reflect and to feel. It's the harmonious blend of all of that, all of those rays or energies, the help of those masters. That is a tremendous positive influence on our planet. It's actually helping. It's one of the, the great influences in helping to evolve a higher age of spiritual consciousness at this time. So that's what we want to feel. That's what we want to make a connection with. In uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, Paramahansaji wrote this. He said, a disciple is spiritually magnetized by reverent contact with a master. Reverent contact with a master. A subtle current is generated. And the disciple's undesirable habit mechanisms in the brain are often as if cauterized, dissolved, burned away. The grooves of his worldly tendencies are beneficially disturbed. And momentarily, at least, he may find the secret veils of maya lifting and glimpse the reality of bliss. And on other occasions, he said this. He said, those who tune in feel that energy coming to them from the darshan of a saint or master, and their brain cells are changed. Just as a rich person can bestow largesse on his family, so the master who has realized God can transfer that spiritual consciousness to disciples who are in tune as divine peace, wisdom, love, and bliss. So that's what we're talking about when we speak of that spiritual transmission. And each of you will get to know these great conduits of divine consciousness, these great masters, during the meditations, during the classes throughout the week. And I do mean know them. You see, you'll find as the days go along. 
You know, whenever, um, whenever I'm asked to, to speak to all of you, there's just one thing I can't help but reflecting on, and that is, let me see if I can put it into words. In the treasure house, you might say, this massive treasure house of teachings, SRF and YSS has more than 100 years of wisdom, inspiration, spiritual techniques, divine guidance about how to live. It's endlessly rich. It's endlessly complete. And it's still growing. So I always feel that really my real duty is to point out, to point you to those teachings. Not to add anything that I have or not to point to anything that I have to add. As our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda said, through the teachings you will be in tune with me and the great Gurus who sent me. But I do want to say this. We all know our Guru gave this voluminous amount of teachings. There's books and lessons and classes and there's all the talks that he gave that have been preserved and published, his writings, and we have these videos, and so on. But don't let that become intimidating. It's a blessing. It's a bounty. It's not something that's supposed to make you feel tense or feel that you have to read everything all at once. You know, if you, if you feel guilty because you haven't read every single page of every book or you haven't watched every video or studied every new lesson, that's such a delusion. And I'll tell you why. It's because subconsciously the mind begins then to rationalize. It begins to make excuses for itself and say, well, I, you know, I, I really can't expect to be happy or successful on the path because there's still so much I haven't studied. And uh, these new talks and new classes and new lessons are being released by SRF and YSS every week. So I have a good excuse. Sound familiar? That apply to, uh, to any of you who, who follow these programs that we put on? Well, there's a saying that I heard recently, and it pertains to this. It says, ego tells us, once everything falls into place, then I can find peace. The soul says, find peace, and then everything will fall into place. So here's what we have to keep in mind in connection with this. Our Guru's teachings, I like to compare them, they're like a hologram. You know what that is, a hologram, those photographic images that can be created by specially configured laser beams. And, you know, we see them in entertainment sometimes or on credit cards and so on. And it looks three-dimensional and it moves as you, as you look around it just like a real object. But the interesting thing is this. Every part of a hologram contains the image of the entire object. You know, you can cut off a little piece of it little corner of that hologram, and still you'll be able to see the entire image through it. So that's what I mean when I say our Guru's teachings are holographic in the same sense. If you study the teachings regularly, even a little bit each day, and master even a small part of the essentials, then automatically you access the entirety. Automatically. I remember... When I was a, a new monk years ago in the Pashtunland Ashram where we all start our ashram training, <clears throat> and um, I used to go to, our, to the house brother, Brother Premamoy, with lots of questions. And um, Brother Premamoy was very patient with me. And, and uh, after I'd done this a few times, you know, I came with my little list of uh, questions. Brother, what about this? What about this? What about this? He smiled and he said this to me. He said, you have a lot of questions now. But just remember, as you, as you study Master's teachings over the years, the time will come 
when all of a sudden everything just clicks into place. It clicks into place. You really understand the whole picture. And then you know the answer to any question about following the path. You see what the point is? That's what we don't need to feel stressed about the volume of teachings. Instead, we can celebrate it. We can rejoice in it and know that if we develop this attunement, that's the secret, attunement with the guru, attunement with the guru's thoughts. And the more we perfect that attunement, then we find something remarkable. We find that whatever guidance we need will flow to us in the moment we need it. And that happens either through a silent voice of intuition, a feeling of guidance, a prompting from within, or it happens through whatever writing of the gurus that we happen to be studying at any given time. I can't say enough about how, um, what a treasure, what, a, what an amazing resource this is for devotees on the path. Study of the teachings keeps us in tune with the guru. And so that's why I'm emphasizing right from the beginning of this week-long program, this most important aspect of convocation. Don't come just for the information. Come to receive the transmission of spiritual consciousness. Now let me say a few things about um, what the world is going through. You know, we all know in this past year, most people have gone through some very difficult challenges, different kinds of tests or trials. And most of you know, I think, that many years ago, our guru spoke of a world crisis that was going to take place as our world moved from the darker materialistic ages moved up into a higher age. I talked about this at convocation a couple of years ago. And I mentioned that it was very interesting that over the decades, many people wonder when different, um, you know, different uh, crises or problems or catastrophes or pandemics or economic downturns come along. They wonder, is this the, is this the crisis? Is this the difficult period? that was predicted. And they would, a lot of people would write to Sri Dayamata and they would say, uh, is, this what, is this the crisis? And she, she had this to say. When people would ask her, um, is this the time? She would just say, well, what would you do if it were? What would you do if it were? And then do just that. In other words, Take the teachings, take the plan of life that our guru has laid out for us and put that into practice. We don't have to wait. We don't need to wait until we're shaken into that um, motivation. The more we start to put that into practice, the more we start anchoring our life on the rock, not just of the written teachings, not just of the information in the teachings, but on that actual connection with the divine consciousness in our very souls. That's the whole purpose of the teachings. That's the whole point of the teachings and the techniques. And that is what convocation is presenting. Now, of course, we, we have to be realistic about what we see going on, the inharmonies, the, the troubles that are in so many areas of modern life. And yes, um, devotees, as with any responsible citizen, we should all do our part to contribute solutions to the problems. In whatever way, God and our soul guide us from within. And yet, on the other hand, on the other hand, it doesn't help if we let ourselves become a victim of fear, if we succumb to fear, or if we find ourselves constantly obsessing about these things by being addicted to a 24-7 news media feed. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? That's a powerful temptation. We have to recognize it as such and we have to be realistic about it and we have to put up our spiritual armaments, you might say, our spiritual guard against 
that ceaseless barrage of negativity. Yes, again, be realistic. But as our guru said, let's be divine realists. Divine realists. He, he said this one time, he said, I'm telling you, be a divine realist. Be a divine realist and you will find all the, they find the answer to all questions in God. It's a, you know, it's a real temptation. The, um, when we are inflicted with the, the sense that, um, that conditions are going from bad to more bad or worse, and that's certainly been the experience of many this past year, you know, human nature has a tendency, again, to rationalize and to say, Yes, yes, I, 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 know, I know what Diamata said and she answered last time I asked. But since then, things are different. So is there a, is there a revised plan? You know, that, uh, that may be the attitude of so-called realist from the human point of view, but not of the divine realist, not of the divine realist. So if, um, if you're expecting that because of the uh, current events in the world that at this year's convocation, we're going to be presenting something, um, you know, quote, new and improved, as they say, compared to previous years. Let me assure you, there is no revised plan. There is no revised plan. The only solution is to hold patiently to the course which has been set out for us by God and the gurus. Now, as the week goes on, we'll, we'll talk more about the right attitude of SRF and YSS devotees toward world conditions. There's some nice um, uh, suggestions and pointers that, that help us to navigate our way. But for now, I want to just give you these words that Paramahansaji, our guru, wrote to his students. This was many years ago, back in the 1920s. But remember, as he said, I am living in the eternal present. So these words apply to us just as much right now. He said this. He said, Dear ones, the power of truth is secretly spreading in different lands. Like the rising dawn, it is creeping all over, pushing the darkness away. Hold on with faith everlasting in the teacher, the teaching, and God. Hold on with faith everlasting in the teacher, the teaching, and God. You shall see the goal. Lo, it is there, right before you. Maybe some of you remember when our revered Mrinalini Mata, our, again, one of our past presidents, spoke at convocation some years ago, and um, really talking about this same trend of thought. And, and uh, she shared a, a saying that she said meant so much to her. When the Master had said to all his followers, all his disciples, all of us, you and me and all generations, he said, I will show you the way again and again until you get it. I'll show you the way again and again until you get it. So what I'm trying to say, patience and faith, as Guruji said, faith in the teacher and the teaching and in God, these are needed. And courage, courage to persevere. And remember, as Dayamata often often reminded us, don't give in to that gloom and doom. We can find joy along the way. You know, often, this is one of the things that so much impressed me in, in a very personal way from the, the life and example of Dayamataji, when she often would say to us how, um, you know, uh, most of you know that for many years she was the personal secretary, the assistant uh, to Paramahansa Yogananda. And uh, she was the one that he uh, entrusted to, um, to take care of the running of many aspects of the, 
of the work of the organization. And so obviously, you know, naturally, she, um, she always was in coming up against these challenges or problems in the work. And she used to say how often she would go into the master's uh, presence and she would say, she would start to explain to him the problem and he would just stop her and say, just keep your mind here. Just keep your mind on God. Just give it to God. And over and over again, he impressed that on her and she learned it. And one time she remarked to us, she said, if I hadn't learned that lesson, then today I would be nothing more than another harried businesswoman. What a powerful lesson, because far from that, we all know, we all felt and still feel that great beacon of divine love and joy and compassion that she became and that she showered on all of us over the years. But let me share another story um, partly related to this and partly, again, about our revered Daya Mataji um, from the early years in the, in the ashram, my early years in the ashram. This was uh, yeah, back in the 1980s. And um, at that time, our editorial department, of which I was a member at that time, was working on a new book of, um, of Master's uh, Sayings. And uh, we had promised the book to Daya Mata because um, for years she'd been asking that, uh, can't SRF please have a little volume of what she used to call Master's Gems of Thought? And um, she had already planned at this time to uh, hand it out as Christmas gifts. And of course, uh, we didn't want to let her down. We, um, we had made that uh, commitment to her. But I found that you know, as the, uh, these long hours to meet that deadline, Week after week, day after day, it started to make me feel stretched. I mean, it was, it, was, it was beyond anything that I had ever felt before. I mean, honestly, I felt exhausted. <laughs> I felt fatigued. And um, uh, Dayama uh, remarked to, to Brother Paramananda, one of our other monks here, she said, what's wrong with Terence? That's what I was called in those days. What's wrong with Terence? He has no life force around him. <laughs> well, that, believe me, that was a wake-up call. I thought, yeah, I better do something. So I thought about it, and I, I, I meditated about it. And I remembered these words from, from the Master, from Master's writings. He said, the Lord helps those who help themselves. He gave you willpower, concentration, faith, reason, and common sense to use when trying to rid yourself of bodily and mental afflictions, any kind of problem. You should employ, he said, all those powers while simultaneously appealing to him. And here's the key. This is what really struck me. He said, always believe that you are using your own but God-given powers. You're using your own but God-given powers. Ask his aid, but realize that you yourself, as his beloved child, are employing his gifts of will, emotion, and reason to solve all the difficult problems of life. So I took that and I thought, all right, this is going to be my savior. And what I did, I found it when feeling that, uh, that stress of uh, meeting these deadlines of this, uh, this huge project, many times during the day, I used to just stop, close my eyes, look into the spiritual eye, and strongly make this affirmation. By your grace and power, I will succeed. By your grace and power, I will succeed. You know, it wasn't might succeed, it wasn't I can succeed, I will succeed. And the thing is, here's the point. God's grace and power are there for us. That's right. They are there for us. But we have to deploy them. We have to put them into action by our own will. And that's why both parts of that affirmation are needed. 
making that inner contact with the Divine Presence by your grace and power, I will succeed. You see that two parts? You see that balanced attitude, that training that Guruji was giving and is giving to every one of his disciples. And I'm happy to tell you the deadline was met. And uh, <laughs> I guess somewhat appropriately, uh, the book was on um, how to meet life's challenges. And that was the, uh, that's this book that we know today, the um, Where There Is Light, Insight and Inspiration for Meeting Life's Challenges. Now, you notice that uh, Guruji was referring to your own but God-given powers. And so, um, you know, naturally, uh, sometimes it's, uh, uh, we find ourselves asking, okay, where are they? If God gave them to me, somewhere I must have lost them. Well, uh, we may not be at the, um, the hotel as in past years, a physical convocation, but we still have the convocation lost and found department. So if you feel like you've lost those qualities, that's why the theme of this week is discovering your soul's infinite potentials. Stay with the program and you'll find them. Stay with the program and you'll find them. Now to set the, um, to set the theme or the, uh, the keynote for what we're going to be exploring this week, let me just take a few moments and, uh, and read this, share these, uh, these beautiful shining thoughts, as Diamandji said, these gems of thought from the lessons from our Guru's writings. He said, the soul is a divine fountain of God's freely given, ever joyous power and wisdom. And if you allow it, your soul will be an unfailing, all-accomplishing guide to right action for happiness and success. But all too often, expression of the soul's joy and discriminative intelligence is eclipsed by the turbulent emotions that roil the waters of the human mind and feelings, fears and worries, likes and dislikes, moods, anger, hatred, jealousy, and so forth. Therefore, Guruji says, therefore a basic principle of yoga taught both in the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is that control of the emotions is the key to health and happiness. Control of the emotions is the key to health and happiness. The happiest and most successful individuals <clears throat> are those who have learned to live with right mental attitude and inner self-mastery of the ego-created emotional reactions and moods. And he said, many persons blame outer circumstances or they blame the behavior of others when they experience hurtful emotions. But unwanted emotions arise from one's own <clears throat> lack of control over chitta. Chitta meaning that quality of feeling, the, the, the aggregate of consciousness that expresses through the incarnate mind. Unwanted emotions arise from one's own lack of control over chitta, the feeling, and they can be neutralized by applying the yoga science of even-mindedness and self-mastery. So then he went on and he gave, uh, he gave this exhortation to each one of us. And now uh, be warned that um, the guru tells it like it is. This is not a sugar-coated explanation. And I think if he were here, we might very well see him talking like he did in that film clip that I mentioned from Awake when he was, you know, forcefully impressing this on our, on our consciousness. But he does it for one reason, because he loves us. 
He loves us and he wants us to see, he wants to see us become free. So listen to his words with that motivation in mind. If you have led a life dominated by worldly influences, do not let the world impose its delusions upon you any longer. You should control your own life henceforth. You should become the ruler of your own mental kingdom. Fears, worries, discontent, and unhappiness result from a life uncontrolled, uncontrolled by wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the very nature of the soul, the very nature of the soul. So we meant just think of it. Any time that we, we feel bothered or any time we feel troubled or worried or afraid or frustrated or anger, angry, any kind of physical or emotional upset, there's one reason. We have lost our awareness of the soul. Now, I urge you, don't let that be a discouraging thought. It's not a discouraging thought if we take it as a divine realist. And remember that identifying the problem is the first step to solving it. And to me, that attitude, that's what makes this convocation so exciting, so um, something we look forward to so much, because this whole week is a practical workshop, giving us the tools we need to reclaim our forgotten divinity. For the next week, for many hours each day, we're going to be exploring together and more importantly, we're going to be practicing together the teachings given by Paramahansa Yogananda to remedy that loss of connection with the soul. There's been a lot of time, a lot of loving effort that's gone into preparing this week for each, for all of you. The program has been especially designed to help you navigate spiritually through these difficult times. We have a wonderful roster of our uh, classes uh, presented by some of our senior monks and nuns. I think you're going to find a tremendous amount of help in their wonderful and inspired presentations. And also accompanying each of the classes in the short experiential workshops and guided meditations that are uh, presented along with the classes. This is something new that we're introducing this year for all of you. Again, to make it uh, not just information, but experience, transmission of spiritual consciousness. So now I'm going to turn you over to the other monks and nuns until later in the week. And uh, by the way, I don't mean just the monks and nuns that you're going to be seeing on your computer or TV screen. They're just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know how an iceberg that uh, you only see 10% and the 90% is underwater? Well, the other hidden 90% of that iceberg are the two or 300 monks and nuns in our ashrams all over in the United States, in India, in Europe, who you won't see but who I've requested to especially pray for you throughout this week. To pray that all of you who are participating in convocation receive tremendous spiritual blessings. Receive that transmission of spiritual consciousness. So just remember, in addition to your own efforts, in addition to the, the help and blessings of God and the gurus, know that you have spiritual well-wishers in all our ashrams around the world who are silently and constantly supporting you in a powerful way. So can we go back just to the beginning then? And, and uh, now in the context of everything we've talked about this morning, let's go back to that experience of forging the connection, of forging that openness and receptivity where that transmission of consciousness can take place. So again, sit up straight. Inhale the breath. 
And hold and feel that peace is flowing into your body and cells and nerves and thoughts and feelings. Inhale, hold and exhale. Feel peace permeating your whole being. And now with the eyes closed and uplifted and gazing into that point between the eyebrows, the spiritual eye, the Christ consciousness center, the center of Kutashta Chaitanya. Visualize that great aura of divine golden light shining out of eternity on your body, mind, and soul. And visualize in that great aura of golden light, that sphere of blue, pure divine consciousness in the midst of which is that diamond-like radiant white star of cosmic consciousness. Visualize that, more than visualize that. Feel that spiritual blessing, that spiritual power pouring from that divine portal in the spiritual eye over your whole being. Feel that you're receiving it. Feel that it's washing you cleansing you, purifying you, energizing you. And awakening the reality of your soul, beloved of God, beloved of God. And in closing, I want to read just a few poetic lines. Our guru wrote this in a poem that he called The Cup of Eternity. And he talks about that spiritual eye that we're just visualizing and experiencing. He talks about that as a little cup, a little orb from which the soul can drink. So and when, he, when I read these lines and he talks about the little orb, that's what he means, the spiritual eye, that portal to divine consciousness. So these, are, these words are for all of you. He wrote, The traveler of the endless track, all weary, thirsty, sore doth seek to quench the quenchless mortal thirst the wordless worry of the heart. He spies a cup, a little orb, and hies to drink with joyful sob. Now in the little cup he'll see unsounded deep of eternity. For ageless hours and endless days, the ambrosial drink he'll taste and praise. The deathly thirst, so fleshly born, shall parch his soul, O oh, ne'er again. The cup he'll drink, but not the bane, to quench his thirst and bliss attain. And for other thirsting souls he'll weep and beg them from the cup, drink deep. For other thirsting souls he'll weep and beg them, from the cup, drink deep. So my beloved friends, that's my wish and my prayer for each one of you. From the cup of this convocation, drink deep, drink deep. God bless you until we meet again.